Joshua Walker here at Japan Society. I am excited to share tea time today with Akiko Katayama, who's a food writer and a Forbes columnist based right here in New York City, who's also a host and producer of the fabulous Japan Eats, a weekly radio show and podcast on Heritage Radio Network, which introduces Japanese food culture to a global audience. If you haven't listened to it, you definitely have to check it out. It's one of my favorite. I just listened to my friend Jeremy Hunter. Akiko, uh, great to have you. Tell us about yourself. How do you get how do you become a, a, a food host or a podcast of such a great idea? Where did the concept come from? How did you end up working on this here in New York? I'm, I was born and raised in Tokyo. And when I grew up, I didn't like eating and I didn't like Japanese food in particular. So my parents had a hard time feeding me. Um, but then everything changed when I started backpacking uh, during my college years. So um, the first year, the junior year, I went to England, and as yes, I spent the whole summer there, and uh, so I made a bunch of friends. So during the following year, I backpacked alone to visit each one of them throughout Europe, and that was a turning point. So I visited my friends. Of course, you have to eat what they're eating at home. And for example, um, when I went to Germany, my friend's grandmother, she was 90 years old, she made me a white sausage, which I had no idea of. And I tried it. And, wow, this is one of the most delicious things I've tried in my life. So, so food, I realized it's very important to discover the culture and get connected with people. So when I was backpacking, I visited so many cities, but New York was the only place I wanted to live one day. German sausage and love of New York brought you to New York. And even though you didn't start out liking <laughs> Japanese food, now you're kind of one of the foremost food experts with your podcast, Japan Eats. What is it about Japanese food in particular, more broadly, but also in this moment uh, that you think uh, you want the world to know about? Mm. You know, Japanese cuisine has an interesting history, this country. So 1970s, 70s, um, there's a Japanese business person uh, cleverly invented uh, creative sushi rolls, like spicy tuna roll and California roll, to make uh, sushi um, popular among general American consumers. And that was the beginning of Japanese food boom. And in 1990s, uh, Hollywood stars started to appreciate the healthy, beautiful food, like, you know, Nobu restaurant by Nobu Matsuhisa, they combined Latin spicy food and uh, authentic Japanese food. So these two are non-Japanese, Japanese, not authentic Japanese food that made American people like, wow, that's interesting. And now in New York City, um, people don't mind paying over $200 per person authentic sushi. So there is a history and I think we are headed towards really more authentic version of Japanese cuisine. So in a way, um, so that's the whole background. Now everybody is familiar. And then ramen boom also joined since uh, 15 years ago when uh, David Chang opened uh, Momok Noodle Bar in East Village. So I think uh, I heard it's uh, 5,000 ramen restaurants in the whole country. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so yeah, from all level, at any level of uh, Japanese cuisine, from uh, expensive kaiseki to casual ramen to supermarket sushi, that's the approachableness right now about Japanese food that makes it really popular and healthy. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about New York City in particular. You talked about the boom, and, and in some ways it began here in New York where the, these ideas kept on. And in some ways, New York is a food capital of the world. So what makes it here makes it everywhere. Um, when I was a child coming back to America, everyone made fun of me for eating Japanese food. Now in New York City, I seem very sophisticated when I know Sapporo ramen, I know different varieties of food. But how popular has Japanese food become in New York? How many restaurants are there? You know, kind of what's the general seen bro breakdown between the kaisekis all the way down to the the ramen kind of b-class food the japanese would consider i forgot the exact number of japanese food restaurants in new york city i think it's about a couple thousands right now famously masa in time Warner building you spend over easily 700 dollars per person that kind of thing but if you go to hoku's in new york um, I mean, it's any, anywhere in the whole country. 
you can have like really decent quality of sushi and packaged in like you can buy for 10, about $10, that the kind of thing. So that's the range. Also, um, this is the city where you can walk to anywhere. It's open all day, all night. And uh, uh, they created American chefs who started to open izakaya and ramen shops. So that's the di diversity that you can try out. Um, and it, I think it's easier than like somewhere like in Ohio or Iowa, the traffic is not as much people not interested in this diversity as much as here. So that's the culture and your mindset. So that's why, um, like I just mentioned, uh, you know, David Chang's uh, Momok Noodle Bar, there's still a line after 16 years of opening. Mm -hmm. There's always a line. So, um, yeah, I think it's more so mindset and people like to look for something new all the time. And a Japanese food, um, especially because it's a uh, healthy food, people still keep ch chasing the latest of Japanese food. That's what I feel mm. in this uh, city. Well, I think that that passion that you feel is something that a lot of people feel for Japanese food. And in some ways, Japanese food and cuisine uh, personifies Japan in some ways. Do you believe that this contributes to better understanding of Japan in the United States through its food, through its cuisine? Oh, definitely. So, um, so food is good when it's uh, at your table, you're impressed by how delicious it is, how beautiful it is. And it's all those aesthetics part of it is important, but there's so much behind it. Um, for example, um, so there is a phrase, uh, no kami, mm. means there are 8 million gods in life. And so I think it's based on the uh, Shintoism, but there is God everywhere from in your water glass to grain of rice. So I think Japanese mindset is motainai. You can't, don't waste it. So anything you kill, animal, um, fish, vegetable, you can't waste anything because it was a gift from nature. Mm -hmm. So that kind of mindset, you can see uh, like, you know, uh, Japanese fishermen have a special technique called ikejime. That means, uh, well, ikejime is a technique to kill fish instantly with a long wire by destroying the, the spinal cord of the fish so that it doesn't suffer. By doing it, you respect the life and also the quality of fish remains as fresh as possible. So it begins even from fishermen mm -hmm. before it gets to the table. And those things you can't see from restaurant's table. Typically, when I think of Japanese food, I, I think of the word omotenashi. Mm -hmm. It's a Japanese style of hospitality. Um, so one, one of my guests on the show, she went to Japan and she has long hair and she went to ramen shop and she was struggling with her hair as like not to dip her hair into the bowl. And the staff person saw her and she quietly approached her, gave her a band to tie her hair, that kind of thing. And it's not a tipping system mm. in Japan, right? And it's just, it's a genuine um, care. So motenashi, by definition, is a service without expecting any returns. So like, if you go to Kaiseki restaurant, and when you finish dinner and leave the restaurant, the chef or general manager or such person who's available come out with you and the bow, thank you for coming. And until you turn the corner and be off their site, they keep bowing. They don't even look up. They just genuinely thank you for visiting the restaurant. And uh, it's like Ichigo Ichie, right? One time, uh, no second time. You share this precious experience with us. Yeah, I think that the spiritual connection or the connection of sustainability between nature and food and awareness of being multi-nai or wasting things is something that you've already highlighted and particularly COVID-19 uh, is even more relevant. Do you expect that this means that Japanese food will continue to be more and more popular? Do you think it's going to go more mainstream? What's the next kind of sushi roll innovation that you expect for Japanese cuisine in the United States or globally? Mm. I think about that often. 
Um, so, so far, ramen and uh, sushi are the two most important um, signature Japanese dishes. And what's common in between, between the two? That's a carbohydrate. Carbohydrate mm. is really approachable and you need it. It's a reasonable price. Uh, if you want to make it, it's reasonable. And I thought about uh, udon, but I don't know. Donburi is a rice, it's a gluten free. Mm. And the donburi means just a bowl of rice topped with something. And you can be creative. So I think Donburi may be. So do you have any upcoming projects that you'd like to share with us that further promotes Japanese cuisine and food in the world? Uh, yes, I do. I'm working on my uh, second book. Mm -hmm. um, the first book came out in January. And this is a plug. <laughs> it's a called uh, uh, A Complete Guide to uh, Japanese Cuisine. And mm -hmm. it's a bilingual book. I featured... Um, 90 dishes with ingredients and uh, cultural background. Uh, it's from, I mean, 90 authentic dishes, not just, uh, you know, sushi ramen, but included um, uh, sweets to regional dishes to beverages. So, and the second book is going to be the same, but you can dig deeper into uh, more background matters. Yeah. No, this is great. I can't wait to get get my hands on the copy, especially as we get ready for Christmas time. I think this is there's been a there's been a food craze, and more people are spending time preparing and making food at home. So even uh, my family is asking me to make more curry rice, which is the favorite we have in my house. It's kind of our <laughs> comfort food. Uh, I'm not a great chef by uh, by by training, but maybe I can be inspired by uh, your book. So I look forward to to reading that. Um, <laughs> Thank you. But, so if the world was going to end tomorrow, uh, what would be your last supper? I like the question. Um, can I have multi-courses? Sure. What, what, <laughs> give us the different versions. You're just going to make me hungry talking about all these things. But I, I can't, you know, talking to a professional like you, I have to get all your insights. Okay. Um, so I would start with a great glass of sake to toast to my friends, family, whoever should my their time with me while I'm alive. And uh, I really crave for... Uh, Yakizakana mm. is it's a you know the simple grilled fish, mm. but it's usually seasonal. My favorite is mackerel. It's a lot of mummy, very fatty and clean, just deliciousness. And I really want to have my mom's uh, nimono. Nimono mm. is a simmered dish. My mom's version is a lot of carrots, um, potatoes, and some chicken, and just delicious. And I would also have some piece of sushi, like, uh, you know, hikari mono get shiny, mackerel, kohada, um, that kind of like really mummy rich sushi. And, and I would finish with dessert. I would like to have New York style cheesecake <laughs> <laughs> with a cup of coffee. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, I think that that Last Supper actually personifies you perfectly in terms of beginning with your Japanese roots and the simplicity of home and then kind of ending with the, the New York cheesecake that represents your home today. So thank you for being such a great representative for the food scene. Uh, we at Japan Society are excited to continue to support all the things that you're doing. I look forward to uh, continuing the conversation. Thank you for jo joining today's Tea Time with us, Akiko. Thank you so much.